So yeah, uh, what I want to do is I want to talk about the Phoenix and uh, what I did in terms of uh, making an S meter for it, what kind of I went through, my thought process, and uh, it's basically my approach to building a S meter. And I uh, just want to caution you, this is not a tutorial. You know, it's I'm no expert on, on uh, this stuff. And so I'm going to quote uh, Charlie Morris here as, you know, this is not a tutorial. It's a log of what I did, right or wrong. So I'm not claiming to be an expert. I'm not claiming to, to be a guru on S meters. So you always need to take whatever I say with a grain of salt. And for you, Ken, with tequila. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Okay, so what I want to do tonight is I want to, first of all, just a brief introduction of what S meter in is. I think as as amateur radio operators, we should all know what, what S meter is and how it works. I'll talk with some approaches to making uh, or, you know, using S meters and then talk about uh, uh, two techniques in terms of uh, building a, a S meter. So just as an introduction, your S meter is giving you, you know, a signal level of your receive voltage in a receiver. Can you guys see this okay? Because sometimes I can go to a full screen mode and you can see things a little clearer. I like that's using that's the side, I like using the sidebar because then I can move around. I could know what slides I need to go and show. But here so anyway, so a S meter is giving you the the received it's giving you an indication of the received um, signal that's coming in from your, your your antenna. And here's the voltages that's coming into your antenna. And if you just look from an S9 to an S1, the difference here is goes from two millivolts, about two millivolts, to 200 nanovolts. That's 10,000 times difference in magnitude, huge. And the different types of uh, uh, S meters, there's the analog S meter, which is, you know, from a, uh, uh, a microamp amp meter, and you draw your uh, your various graduations on the uh, scale, and you, it gives you an ind indication of your S meter. Or you could have a digital uh, S meter where your bars are telling you, you know, where you are in terms of uh, um, your S meter. And uh, there's lots of circuits around here that shows you you know uh, how to build an s meter and there are people who are far smarter than me who've done done this and they've got circuits that work and uh for example here's a circuit up here uh this looks like it's from a doug demal workbook or somewhere from that type that that era it could be from wes hayward's book i, I don't know but uh it's basically taking an analog um, uh, audio frequency coming in, amplifying it, rectifying it, and then it's using a micro uh, amp meter to show the uh, relative uh, signal strength. And uh, that's this is how majority of uh, S meters are done. They take an audio frequency in, and if if you look at the early, you know, rend renditions of the um, BIDX, you know, that's what was done. They took a analog feed before the LM386 and they took that and digitized it and was able to, to display um, what the uh, uh, signal strength was. In, in some cases, some people may take the input from the uh, IF stage of your uh, radio or, and they may couple it with an AGC. Here's a Charlie Morris video where he implements this as a AGC. So it's putting out an AGC signal here, which is gonna control the amplification of a downstream amp. And he's taking that same voltage and feeding it to a uh, ammeter and uh, showing the uh, S meter there. Now the challenge in any of this is you gotta, this is about 10,000 fold. So, and I think with these meters that you could you could get like a logarithmic nature. You got very small to to very large currents. I, I don't I don't know I don't know how these meters work. So I'm 
uh, I'm not going to comment on the good and bad of it. But if you kind of take a look and you look, let's just go from S1 to S9 plus 20, that's 20 uh, dB over an S9 signal. And you look at the, the, the voltage that's coming in, just, just, for, just for that, it's 2,500 times. And if you plot the S meter, the S reading at the bottom and the voltage here, it goes up, you know, it goes up um, in an exponential fashion. It's not a linear curve. It's, a, it's an exponential factor. And especially down these two values, they differ by 10 uh, dB. All these other uh, values here, you'll see in a subsequent slide, they change by 6 dB. So we use logs to help us with this when we've got this large uh, variation in numbers and it compresses it down to make the numbers smaller, the variation to be smaller. So if we do the same levels, but now we use the DBM, because if you go back to my scale here, it shows you what the DBM is here, right? So if you just take the DBM signal here, which is a power reading, right? The power input to the radio, and you plot that, and you plot that, the DBM reading, as a function of S reading, you get a straight line. And the benefit here, the variation is about three times. So three times 53 less than three times 53 is, uh, you know, 120. So a lot, it compresses the data you have to deal with and you can get a nice straight line. So it's far easier to visualize this. And again, here, the key thing to, to mention here is these numbers differ by 6 dB. DB. And I think 6 dB in a voltage, that's doubling the voltage, right? I think, I think 3 dB is a doubling of power, and 6 dB is a doubling of voltage. So here's, you know, I, here's some approaches I looked at that I thought of, you know, in terms of uh, implementing an S meter and some of them are silly, but I'm just going to mention in any case. So the, the first option here is if you look at this as a, a traditional radio, you've got your antenna, you've got your uh, bandpass filter, you've got your first mixer, you've got your IF filter, maybe some IF amplification here, and then you've got another mixer here, and that's going to uh, bring it down to, uh, to audio. It goes to your, your audio amp and then goes to your speaker. So in terms of, you know, getting the relative signal strength coming in from your antenna, you could certainly look at the signal that's here after the band, band pass filter. The issues with doing that, though, it's now you're dealing with an RF signal. So you've got a radio frequency signal you're, you're going to have to detect. And uh, it's going to be difficult to isolate the signal of interest because, you know, this band could be, say, 200 kilohertz or 500 kilohertz or something of, of that order. And so all those signals you're going to be uh, detecting here. So you can't really look at the specific signal of uh, interest. And... It gets worse because if you've got an RF amplifier at the front end here, a low noise amplifier at the front end, which the Phoenix does have, you know, the reading you read here is going to be dependent on how much gain you've got here. So if you take a, a reading here and you change the gain here, it, this reading is going to change. So the next step is to do like what others have done is just, uh, especially for an AGC circuit, is to look at the signal coming in, coming off your IF uh, filter. The benefit of doing this is that you're looking at about, you know, three kilohertz, two kilohertz of bandwidth. So now you're, you're sharply focused on the signal of uh, interest. So the downside is, you know, many IF stages, you're dealing with RF. You have to now uh, detect an RF signal and uh, could be uh, difficult. And same thing as with uh, the, the other um, 
implementation is if, if you've got an RF amplifier at the front end, uh, you change the gain at the front end, that's gonna change your, your reading here. So that's one option. The next option is to use the audio signal. So if you look at the audio signal coming out of the mixer, um, you're looking at this, all of a sudden now you're dealing with audio frequencies, which are relatively easier to deal with. And uh, you could uh, detect and amplify them a lot easier. Uh, however, same thing as the, all of the other uh, uh, detection processes, if you've got a um, RF amplifier at the front end here with a variable gain, that's going to change what you're seeing here. And, and in fact, in my ICOM radio, I've got a button that's got a preamp. I can't select how much gain I've got my front end, but I can in, introduce a fixed amount of gain. And if I go and I uh, change the gain, what happens is that uh, the S meter uh, reading goes up. So, you know, and the other thing that depending where you put that, if heavens forbid you, you do your detection here, it's going to be dependent on your AF gain, uh, on your audio frequency gain. So in terms of this is the way I kind of thought about it and I talked a little bit about this is that, okay, so there are two ways of doing this. One is you need to measure RF signals. And the way you could do that, you could use a diode detector, but you got you know, fairly weak signals, especially if you're coming in from the IF stage. That's a fairly weak signal down around, I don't know, maybe minus 50 dBm kind of thing, minus 40 dBm. It's it's relatively weak signal, so you're going to have to amplify it. You know, for and I've seen others do it using a diode detect, detect, detector. I've seen uh, recently a video where this guy takes a diode uh, and he was able to detect like very, very small currents. And it's a matter of integrating it over time and you can get a fairly accurate reading. But to me, you know, I think the diode, you need to get around that 0.7 or if you've got a shot key or a germanium diode, you know, you still have that, uh, that forward voltage drop that, that you have to overcome. The other approach which Peter suggested is to use the uh, AD 8307, which is the, uh, we use that in SNAs and power meters. That's the logarithmic power amplifier. And that goes down, I think, uh, you know, well down into the minus 70, minus 80 dBMs um, signal level and can go right up to, I think, like uh, zero or, or plus one or two dBM. So it's got quite a large di dynamic range. The issue here is complexity because all of a sudden you got to deal with RF. It gets complex. If you're using an 8307, it gets complex, you know, and but certainly I think it's going to be a lot more accurate. So if you use, use an audio signal, it's going to be simpler to measure and filter because audio, you can basically use RF uh, RC filters, right? However, I suspect there's going to be much more noise, uh, induced noise, because if you go back to the little receiver, so now in your receiver, you're looking at the output coming out here, right? Let me expand this so get a good view of it. So you're looking at the signal coming out here. So each of these parts here, especially if you got amplifiers, they're introducing noise. So, you know, the noise content you've got here is going to be dependent on all the noise of these stages coming in. So I suspect it's going to be a lot noisier detecting a signal here than it is here. You're going to get uh, uh, a lot lower noise. Okay, and uh, lower complexity, but I, I, I have a feeling it's going to be less accurate, less sensitive, but... Uh, complexity, it's not lower complexity, trust me. After going through this, it's not lower complexity at all. So, you know, at this point, you need to take a step back, and, and this is what I did, and, and this presentation really helped me to solidify that, is that you got to take a step back, and you got to see the forest from the trees. And what's the goal here? 
you know, and how accurate does this really need to, to, to be? And is an S meter a precise instrument? And uh, you all know the answer uh, to, to this. It's a relative gauge. It's not meant to be a precise instrument. So with that in mind, here's the final approach. This is what uh, this is how I decided to implement uh, the uh, S meter for the Phoenix. First off is to use audio. Uh, take a look at the signal before the final AF amp. Uh, apply filtering to clean up the noise, so that because that signal coming out of the final uh, filter, it's got mixing uh, products. It's got both audio, but it's also got RF coming out. So you got to filter that junk out. And I'm not going to use a uh, analog meter. I'm going to use a uh, microcontroller. So I'm going to use the microcontroller ADC, digitize the signal, and display it on a bar cha chart. So I'm going to use a microcontroller software approach. And I'm going to try and reduce uh, the hardware. Because by using uh, the uh, microcontroller, I'm using less hardware. I don't have to implement a meter. I don't have to you know, play around with that. And I decided I'm going to use op, op amps. Keep it simple. They work, especially at audio. You know, they work very well. They're well known, precise, you know, and uh, use that. So this was back in the grandfather to the Phoenix, the Dueling 612, the D6612. This was how uh, I implemented the S meter circuit. So I took the audio signal coming in from the mixer, coming in, I fed it to a LM386 uh, with, I think with this pin here with a 10 microfarad uh, cap across pin one and eight, you got the maximum gain coming out of this. Then I had a detector here, a diode detector here, and a capacitor to, uh, you know, uh, convert the ripple coming off of this to a to a DC level, and I fed that to the ADC uh, for the microcontroller ADC of the Dueling 612, and it worked relatively well. However, it was a royal pain in the ass to calibrate and implement in software. So I decided to innovate. So in the Phoenix, I applied, um, I used two amplifiers, these are NE5532s, they're very cheap. And I basically use the amplification stages that uh, Pete Giuliano used in one of his uh, projects. He had an audio amplifier where he uses these amps along with a LM, I think it was a 380, not a 386, it was a 380. And, uh, you know, I think there was a, like a two watt, uh, that LM380 was, a, I think it was about a two watt. Amplifier. So I just took those stages here and I put those, married those uh, together, had a detector stage here. So I got the only the positive going ripples, a capacitor to convert the ripple to DC, and I connected the um, ADC, microcontroller <coughs> ADC. Okay. The issue was now. In, when I was redesigning the Phoenix, every circuit in the Phoenix, every single circuit, circuit I simulated in LT Spice, and I also built a proof of concept, a POC board. Okay, I built a, a, a proof of concept board, tested it, make sure it works, and then I married it together in the Phoenix. I did that all except for the S meter. I remember having a conversation with Peter before we put this, uh, sent this off to GLC PCB, you know, is what happens if this doesn't work? And sure enough, it didn't work very well. Well, it didn't work at all because the problem was it had too much, too wide of a dynamic range. Because remember back here when I came back and I said, look at, look at the dynamic range here because I'm dealing with voltages. So here, you've got a 2,500-fold in increase in voltage going across here. And that amp, where's that amp? Right here. And that amp just couldn't support that uh, dy dynamic range. Because one of the reasons was these op amps were single-sided. 
So they were fed with, with 12 volts on the plus rail and on the negative rail, it was grounded. And we had to put a bias. We had to put six volts here between the uh, six and 12. So you got it swinging around the uh, six volts coming out. So you only got a six volt swing and the NE5532 is not a rail to rail op amp. So it's more like maybe, you know, from six volts to 10 volts. So that limited the dynamic range of it. And the voltage coming out here, it was just too high for the uh, ADC. I would fry the board. So this just did not work. And again, so I decided to uh, innovate. I went back to, to the drawing board and I did some more innovation. I thought, okay, well, let me try a peak detector then. So uh, this is an L. LT Spice, and I actually built this on a subsequent slide. I'll show you the data I got from uh, when I built this, and I actually um, got some uh, real life numbers. So right up front here, I put a, 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 band, a low pass RC filter here to take away all the uh, RF signals coming in. And uh, by the way, the, the other amplifier here, I didn't have an RC filter here because I didn't need it because these op amps here, I felt you know, they would do the filterings uh, themselves because these are audio uh, amplifiers. So any RF coming into them would get attenuated out. It would not make it through. But in this version here, I decided to put an extra RC filter in, even though I know these are audio amp amplifiers and RF would get, you know, um, you know, shunted to ground. It wouldn't... Uh, be amplified. It wouldn't make make it through. So I created this. Uh, here's just is just a buffer amplifier. It's uh, it's giving me uh, five times gain. And uh, here's the peak detect detector here. And basically all it is is a amplifier, and you put a diode. And I'll explain a second how that diode works. And what's coming out uh, from here is this is. This is following the peaks. It's following the humps. So only the positive humps are coming through and you're only, this is following the positive humps here. And you put a diode here to smooth those humps out. So you get a little, little bit of ripple. And uh, this uh, resistor is to bleed that diode off, uh, that uh, capacitor off once it gets charged. And this I'm just simulating in this L LT spice simulation, this is the sample and hold capacitance of a, a typical ADC of a microcontroller. It's around 14, 20 ish picofarads. So I just put that in just to see if it's going to make a difference. So I ran my simulations. If you want to see how an op amp works, I encourage you to go back to my op amp video, which goes through, you know, how an op amp works. So what I'm going to just, I'm not going to explain in detail how the op amp works. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what it's doing. If you want to get deeper in, into this, uh, go look at my uh, prior video. So the way this works is you've got your op amps here. You've got VN coming into the plus terminal and your negative terminal is your minus terminal is connected to the uh, output in a feedback loop. So the way op amps work is anytime the plus terminal is bigger than the minus terminal, the output goes towards the plus rail, the plus voltage, the plus voltage source. That's called the plus rail, right? So it swings up there. And as this voltage difference, as long as like it's microvolts or hundreds of microvolts, not, uh, yeah, microvolts, um, this will swing up and it just goes whoop right up and it hits the uh, 12 volt rail. It does it in a sort of a, a, a linear fashion, but it's almost like a straight line. So as soon as this terminal is larger than this terminal, this voltage here goes whoop and it goes right up to uh, 12 volts. And if you listen, you could hear the op amp making that noise. Whoop, you could hear it. I'm joking. So. Now, the, the opposite, if the plus terminal is lower than the minus terminal, okay, the op amp 
goes whoop, and it goes down to the minus 12 volts rail. So this output is always going plus or 12, depending on if plus the plus terminal is greater or less than the minus terminal. So the way this works, so if you've got a signal coming in, initially, let's just assume this is zero. Okay, so zero signal coming in, and all of a sudden, it starts going up. You got a sine wave. It starts going up. As soon as this creeps up a little bit, this comes up just a tiny microvolts. You know, it uh, it uh, comes up. You know, what happens is this terminal here goes whoop goes up to twelve, and as this is a diode, and let's assume it's 0 0.7 volts. Uh, I think this is a Schottky diode, so it's probably like 0.3 or 0.4 volts. But let's just assume it's 0.7 volts, the voltage drop okay, or the forward voltage across here. So this diode only conducts if this side of the diode is 0.7 volts higher than this side of the diode. So, so if we've got a voltage coming up and this goes up to 12, as it's going up to 12 volts, this goes up past uh, 0.7 volts. This starts to conduct. It goes back around and it locks the voltage in. So it locks whatever voltage here is. So let's just say it's 200 microvolts. Right here, it's going to be 200 microvolts. It's going to lock it in. Then if it goes up to 400 microvolts, same thing happens. This is now bigger than that. It goes up. The same thing happens. Uh, you know, this starts to conduct. It goes back around and it locks it in. And so this is locking in whatever voltage here. And the uh, so what what in, in essence is happening at the output here is you're only getting the positive going humps. The negative going hump, because this now, if it goes negative, this terminal is below that terminal. This goes whoop, and it goes to minus 12 volts. And now it's reverse bias, 12 volts. Doesn't matter what's here, it's reverse bias, it doesn't conduct. Okay, so we've got a, a capacitor here that charges, whatever voltage is put here charges this capacitor up. And as that hump in, increases, the voltage here gets stored on that capacitor. And in this circuit here, that this capacitor does not bleed off because the only way it can bleed, it can't bleed through the diode. The only way it can bleed is through this resistor into the negative terminal. Now, an op amp, one of the, if you go back, look at my videos, I'll talk about the input impedance of an op amp. It's very large, very, very large. And because of that, the current flowing into an op amp is very small. It's, it's of the order of nanoamps to picoamps, very, very small amount of cur current. So this capacitor doesn't really bleed off. It bleeds off very, very slowly. And so, um, so right here, this is going to be now the peak because as this comes up, you know, as it follows the peak, it hits the peak. It this capacitor locks in that peak because as the voltage comes down, this peak remains on that capacitor. Okay, so this is the circuit I built. This is in KiCad here, and I milled the board. So you can see the RC filter here. Here's the amp, the front end amp. And I put a, a pot here so that I can control the gain. And here's the peak detector here. Can you guys hear me okay? Am I? I've lost signal here. Have I? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so you've got the peak detector here, right? And so what's happening here now is I put a Zener diode here. I put a 4.9 volt and it was a pain in the butt finding a 4.9 volt Zener diode. Usually they're 5.1 volts and I didn't want to put a 5.1 volt Zener because this here's a protection diode to make sure this voltage here doesn't exceed five volts. I didn't want to fry my microcontroller. So that's just a protection diode to make sure this voltage doesn't go over five volts. Then you've got the capacitor here that charges and holds the voltage. And then here, remember I said the capacitor can't bleed through this path. So we have to put a bleed dio uh, resistor here to bleed that capacitor off. So if the S signal changes, 
it's going to change rel in a relatively short period of time. And so that's it. And here's uh, the other innovation I did was I used a negative charge pump. So uh, this chip produces a minus 12 volt voltage based on a 12 volt input. So now my op amp had a minus 12 volt uh, source for the negative rail and a plus 12 volt source for the positive rail. So the op amp could swing between minus 12 to plus 12 and you must have minus 12 to use this peak detect here. So here's the data that I got out of this. I actually built this, connected up and I've got a video and I'll show you uh, how I measured this in a, in a little while. But uh, here's the S meter strength and here's the DBM level. So this is the signal that got fed. This is not the signal that got fed in here. This is the signal that got fed into the Phoenix. This is connected to the audio output from the mixer, from the uh, um, mixer that's uh, taking the IF signal and it's creating a, um, a uh, audio signal to go to the audio amplifier. So this is what's feeding into the antenna port. This is my peak to peak voltage that I'm seeing here. This is the peak to peak volt voltage I'm measuring here. I'm measuring that with my scope. And then uh, here I'm measuring the, the peak voltage coming off at this point with a meter. I just plugged in a meter and I'm measuring the voltage here uh, coming out. And uh, at one point I connected my ADC as well and I converted the, uh, the voltage to an ADC uh, reading. So once I implemented this, I found that this is the, the only dynamic range. Because what happened if I went above minus 70 dBm into the Phoenix, the peak voltage here was 4.7, which at 4.7, this zener starts kicking in. And so it starts compressing and I, I'm not getting a proper reading at minus 70 dBm here. So that was basically the, so roughly about minus 73 dBm was the top. Anything above that, it starts to compress. And then at uh, the other end, I went down to S5. And if I went down to say minus 100, the output here was about 100, 200 millivolts but it was extremely noisy because there was such, there was a tremendous amount of ripple on the line here. And it just, it, the ADC could not get an accurate reading of it. Even the scope of the, the meter, it's bouncing around. You know, it, um, it, uh, this filter here was not working very well for such low, uh, signals coming in. So the, um, Again, same problem as before, too large dy dynamic range and the voltage here exceeding the ADC. So this is no better than the other circuit I did uh, before. So I decided to innovate some more and I introduced something called a log amp to do a proper log rhythmic measurement of the signal coming in to compress it. To actually not compress it, but to linearize it to get a uh, less dynamic range. Looking at uh, d, d, dBs, you, you still get the, the, the dy dynamic range, but the variation is smaller. So I implemented same circuit as before, implemented a log amp. Here's, here's the log amp, and, the, and I'll talk about how a log amp works in a minute. But in this case, you've got the diode in the feedback chain you're feeding back here and you've got the diode in the feedback chain. And then I added, it turned out the voltages here were, were very, very small. They were small, they were, they were compressed too much. And so I had to put a uh, stage here. A, uh, this is a, a non-inverting amplifier and I'm getting about five times the gain here. Uh, same thing again, I've got a capacitor gets charged up, a zener, and uh, then the, um, the, S, the S meter here, the uh, ADC there. So how this works. So 
if you look at the same as before, if the plus rail, okay, in this case, the plus rail is zero, it's grounded. So in this case, if the minus rail here, sorry, the plus input, the plus input is at zero, it's grounded. The minus terminal, the minus input terminal of the amplifier, if that exceeds zero, it goes up. What happens? This amplifier goes whoop, it goes down to minus 12 volts. So this output goes down to 12 volts, minus 12 volts. Now, if this here was say, let's say this is one volt, okay? This is zero or this is, uh, uh, let me use a different number. Let's just say this is 0.1 volts. This is zero volts. The diode does not conduct because it's not forward biased, right? But now it, once this rail starts going negative, if I've got a plus, a small plus voltage rail here, this is going negative, it's now forward biased and core and current starts to, to flow because the voltage here is lower than the voltage here. It's a negative voltage relative to, to this voltage. And as long as the difference across here is 0.7 volts, it's gonna conduct. Now, the other thing to notice here is that we've got the input coming here to the minus terminal. Since the, the minus terminal uh, has a very large input impedance, very small amount of current flows into the minus terminal. All the current has to flow through this diode, has to flow here. It can't, it has to flow through there. So the current that flows through the diode is given by this equation here. And uh, so this is the diode current. I naught is the saturation current of the of the uh, diode, and that's fixed for a specific diode. It's a constant. NVT is a constant. That's got to do with the, uh, I think VT is the thermal uh, voltage, uh, 0.23 or 0.25 volts, or something like that. N is some kind of constant, ID, ideality constant or something like that. But basically, this is, has to do with the charge of the electron and uh, Boltzmann's constant and the uh, 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 temperature in Kelvin, but ignore that. It's a constant. The, the thing we have to know is this is a constant. That's a constant. It doesn't change. The only thing that changes is VF, the uh, uh, the, the voltage that's going that's going to be fed into the um, diode. Now, if you do a little bit of clever math, you end up with with this equation. And again, NVT is a constant. I naught is a constant. R is just the R here. That's a constant. So I naught R is a constant. It doesn't change. It's like three or 10 or 100 or something. It's a number. It doesn't change. This number doesn't change. The only thing that changes is V in, the voltage in coming in here, and uh, V out, the voltage coming out here. So all of a sudden, we've now got the output voltage as a log of the input voltage. So we've got a logarithmic amp amplifier. And this chart is just showing that it's an exponential nature why it's E raised to a power because after 0.7, you know, the diode starts to conduct in an ex exponential fashion. So if, if you take the log of this, you get kind of a straight line. So here's the data now. Here's the money slide. Here's the data. And uh, I'm, I'm almost done. This is the data that I got after I built the peak detector log amp. So you can see, first thing to notice, look at the dynamic range. The dynamic range here has increased sub sub substantially. I'm going from an S1 to like an S9 plus 10. Uh, I'll talk about this in a second, but it's got quite a large dynamic range here. Here's the DBM. This is the peak voltage. So if I go back to my signal and I look at the peak voltage coming out of my peak detector, so I look at my peak voltage here, right? Uh, that's my peak voltage. And I look at the log voltage. So this now is the voltage that's coming out here. This is the log voltage here. So I'm measuring the peak voltage here with my scope and I'm measuring the output voltage here, okay? 
So you can see here, this is giving me values for the various numbers. And here I looked at the difference between the values because it should be about 6 dB uh, difference. So the numerical value, now because of those constants and stuff like that, you're not going to get exactly 6 uh, dB. But if you look at the difference between the two numbers, you'll see they're always about 0.1 something. 0 0.15, 0 0.16, 0 0.13, they're all 0 0.13, which is good. It means that I'm getting a proper deviation between the various S levels, which is what I would expect. Now, what happens down at the bottom here, S1, is um, down about a minus 120. I couldn't get it lower because uh, 1.44 voltage was the lowest I could get it down. So even if I went to like 1 minus 125, this would always say 1 1.44 volts. I couldn't go below that. So that was my lowest limit I could get to. Then at the top end, it starts to clip around S9 plus 13. So 13 dB above S9, it starts to clip. And that's because of my um, uh, peak de detector circuit, it's clipping. At that point, it's starting to clip, and I'm getting distortion. And you could actually see it on the scope. You'll actually see the uh, wave becoming like a square wave. And you can see here the voltage. Here, it's staying about the same. So it's clipping. And the difference between S9 to uh, S9 plus 10, it's 10 dB over. So it's not quite, it's 6 dB plus 4. So it's an additional 4 dB over. And you can see it's it's about a 0.23 difference. You know, if it was 12 dB over, then this would be 0.3 because it'd be double this, 0.15. It'll be about 0.3, right? So it's... These numbers kind of make sense. So the dynamic range seems to be okay. And what, uh, in a subsequent slide, I'm gonna talk about this, but uh, what I need to do now is just set what the lower limit is so I could get higher range at the top end. So calibration, uh, this separates the men from the boys. So there are two ways that in software you could calibrate this. One is the simple ways that you feed in an S, S9 signal and you hit a button in the microcontroller and you say calibrate and it takes an S9 signal in and says okay I, I know what an S, S9 signal is and I know that if the signal drops 6 dB below that it's an S8 if it drops 6 dB below that it's an S7 and so forth and that's what this algorithm is doing here the other approach is a lot more complex, but it gives a very accurate reading, is that for an S1, you look at what the ADC is reading, you feed in an S1 signal into the Phoenix, you look at what the, the, S, the uh, ADC is reading, and you say, okay, if, if my signal is that, it's a one bar, it's an S1. If my signal, then same thing with an S2. You feed in S2, and you say, okay, if my ADC is this, it's an S2, and blah, blah, blah. You do that for all, all your readings. The problem with this is that you would have to calibrate it with 11 data points as opposed to one data point. This is very complex calibration. This is a very simple calibration. So now I'm going to show you a video. So this is using the simple calibration method, and I'll show you the, the relative accuracy of it. So at this point, here's the S meter board I made. You can see the two op amps here. It's two chips, but it's got four op, op amps. This is the first uh, amplification stage. There's the pot there that's uh, increasing the, uh, um, the amplification at first stage. Here is the peak detector there. You can see the diode right there. Here's the log amp. You can see the diode there for the log amp. And then on this side is just a amplifier to get the DC coming out of this so the, the ADC can read it. This chip here is the voltage pump. So that's taking uh, the plus 12 volts. Here's This is coming in. I had to create a little daughter board here on the Phoenix so I could feed in 12 volts and ground to the board. 
So that's 12 volts coming in. This is taking that 12 volts and it's creating a negative 12 volts. So I got my negative 12 volt rail at the bottom here and my plus 12 volt rail at the top here. And this is the signal that's coming in after the mixer from the Phoenix. And this is the signal that's going to my ADC of my microcontroller. And you can see my scope uh, probe there and uh, where I was probing various things. So now in terms of the experimental, uh, like the source, I've got my uh, signal and signal generator here and I put 7 dB, 70 dB of, of attenuation on the input here. So whatever output I put here, I have to drop it down additional 70 dB. So if I had minus one dB coming out here, the output here would be minus 71 uh, dB coming out. So for the first test, I'm feeding out 14.1 megahertz, you know, minus 45 uh, dBm. You uh, account for the minus 70 dBm, that's 115 dBm, which is an S2 signal. And here you can see it fluctuating. It's saying it's an S1 or S2. So here's an S3. And you can see it's saying S2. It's not quite coming S3. Here's an S4. So it's showing me S3 here. This is an S5. And there it's showing it, it's an S5. And again, this is the simple calibration. This, this is an S6. So there it's saying S6. So it's, it's giving me a good relative reading, right? Here's an S7. It's, here it's showing it's an S8. Here's an S, uh, sorry, yeah, S8. This is now saying S8. Here it's saying it's an S9. So it's a little bit off. Here, it's, this is an S9. It's saying it's an S9. So now this is S10. This is not 10. It's not S9 plus 10. Because uh, I, I couldn't take it down to S9 plus 10 because it distorts. So uh, it, this is S10. So it's it's 6 dB below a uh, or higher than an S9 signal. So it's... It's an S, S10, right? So here it's saying an S10. And so anything above S10 now, it goes up to the next, it goes up to an S11. It goes up, it says S11, which is saying it's like, uh, it's close to 10 dB over S9. Oops. So. So here now, here's the same test again, but now it's with the complex calibration software I'm running. Same test. Let me just skip ahead here. Same configuration. So here we go. So now here it's a minus 120 dBm. So this is like an S1 between S1, S2 signal. And you can see it's going between an S1, S, S2. Again, this is the complex calibration software. Here's an S2. You can see it's peaking at an S2. So it's saying it's rough, roughly an S2. Here's an S3. And it's showing it's an S3. It's peaking out to an S3. This is an S4. So at S4, it's locked in, it's solid at S4, S5. Showing S5. This is S6. So 
It's showing S6. This is S7. Are you guys still there? Are you guys still following this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This, this is S7. Here's an S8. Showing S8. So you can see it's reasonably accurate. Not like the simple calibration, which was, you know, it could be off by one S unit. This is like bang on. Here's S9. It's bang on. Now this is S10, so it's again, it's not a, it's not a, a um, 10 over S9, so it's showing it, it's an S10, and this now it's full strength, it's as high as it can go, and it's locked in at an S11, showing it's uh, over 10 dB, over an S9. So that's it. So you know, forest from the trees. What's the takeaway here? Okay, so going forward, I'm definitely gonna use a peak detector with a log amp. What I need to do now is I need to limit the range that I'm gonna be um, uh, seeing on the, the, S, the S meters. Like, I don't think it's practical to say I'm gonna see an S1 because with the current noise floor around that we get, there's no way you're gonna see an S even an S5 or an S4, because with the noise, typically the noise floor is like six or seven. For me, it's it's six or seven noise floor. So for me to even see an S5, you know, I, I can't see it. So I need to restrict, change, reduce, raise the lower limit so that I could get a higher, higher limit. So I could see potentially an S9, a 20 over, 20 dB over S9. So the way I do that is I'm going to have to use less gain or no gain at, at the front end to allow a higher output and maybe use a better uh, op amp, maybe use a rail-to-rail -rail op amp, but I don't think I need need to. But uh, that's, that's kind of the takeaway for me. And so that's it.